<laughs> so you. nice to see and hear you. You as well. Thank you for doing this. I'm really excited. I think uh, you're just such an incredible person, incredible talent that, first of all, I'm a huge fan. So thank you for taking this time. Oh, um, my pleasure. <laughs> I, I always feel awkward. I, it's just, it's such a weird thing to be a poet for a living in the first place. So I'm always, I don't know, it just feels unnatural <laughs> to be doing <laughs> interviews for poetry, but here we are, so. But here we are for sure. And, um, you know, I think just to get right into it, well, again, thank you so much for taking this time. Um, in speaking of this time, so many things in October. It's National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, domestic violence, invisible disabilities, bullying, bullying. Yeah. So, you know, Jack and I were looking through all the different causes that are, um, that are represented this month. And when we saw bullying, I said, I know exactly who we need to reach out to. Um, it was your poem, Shane, that when did you write to this day? I think I wrote it in 2009, I think, 2009 or 2008. Okay. It was um, a long time ago that I was first introduced to your poem by actually one of my sons. Oh. Said, hey, mom, look at this poem. You love poetry. And that's when I was doing the poetry circuits and whatnot. I was like, well, yes, I do. Um, he says, well, listen to this. And I said, oh my God. And there we listened to your piece, both in tears. And um, wow, I think it's probably of all the poetry I've heard in my lifetime, it is one of the most powerful and profound. Um, <laughs> just so you know, but let's just be clear about that. Um, you know, for anyone who, who has not yet heard your poem, it is a piece that um, we have, uh, uh, that we'll be sharing in our magazine. Um, memorable are so many experiences. Uh, for so many, of being bullied, of being the underdog. For you personally, I have always wondered, pork chop. Was this story of pork chop? Was this a real story? Because sometimes, sometimes I think you can't make this stuff up. But was this a real thing, or was there something else? Yeah, there were no shortage of names I got called in school. Pork chop just happened to have an odd origin around it because of my relationship with my grandmother and and what that meant and so that was the kind of the one that stood out to me as because it became more personal because it was this in joke with my grandmother um that her and i shared between each other and then it became this thing that broke out in school and so it was probably the most affecting name that i got called when i was in school but certainly not the only name um so yeah it was just a I don't know, uh, an emotional tornado of rage and confusion and, you know, despair and anguish. There was a lot of things that I think a lot of people don't take seriously the sort of wound something like that can leave behind because, you know, they don't know the entire story behind it or, or whatever. But then it becomes the danger is in school, it's blood in the water for you know and once the shark starts sort of circling and it catches on if a name catches on and then everybody starts picking it up and they have ownership of it then and it's like them having ownership of a piece of you in some way and it just becomes very demoralizing wow yeah no and you're you're spot on and you're right if it catches on it, it is it's like wildfire it's you know what yeah. they're experiencing right now and, and, you know, I, I think there has been progress for sure. I grew up in a time when school was, there were no posters on the wall if you were being bullied, you know, for that kind of support. There were no support groups. There were no numbers you could call even. So times have changed, and I think progress has been made. But it's, the world has changed as well in, in that, you know, when I went to school, three o'clock, bullying was done, you know? Mm -hmm. And nowadays we live online and there's new, it's like sneaking through someone's bedroom window to then bully them at home. And, the, you know, and so it's just becomes a never ending thing and which is ultimately more problematic. But the good news is there is support out there for people that are going through it. 
Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I think that it's getting better in terms of resources available, but in terms of the bullying, like you're saying, now there's just a new mechanism to be able to, you know, there's a new conduit for it with the internet. It's evolved, you know. Um, sadly, you know, as much as we evolve, you know, the, the methods we use to, you know, harm others evolve as well. And that's, isn't that the thing? It's like, it seems like while we have evolved, it seems like this sort of thing should have dissolved. You know, we should have, you know. There's no reason for it anymore. You know, it, to me, it's like, you know, people say, you know, well, kids get picked on because they're weak. To me, it's ultimately a sign of a larger weakness that you're going after someone who is weak and you're imposing yourself on them using your strength or your you know your social influence or, or whatever it is to go after a person who what, what are you doing you're kicking them up while they're down what is the point yeah. you know um to me it just comes across as very weak right yeah certainly looking at it through that lens you'd see where the weakness is it, just as you're saying on the other side of things right Right. And, it, you know, you hear all the time these people that are like, oh, you need to toughen up or whatever. And it's like, or you need to just stop. Right. You know, it's, why, why are you forcing it, your, your life on someone else? You know, it, it just mm. doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I know. For, for sure not. Um, well, you know, you did such an incredible job in that piece to be able to provide examples and to illustrate, um, you know, uh, what that not only looks like, but what it feels like. And well, there's a strange sort of periphery waltz that happens in school, where if you're the victim of bullying, you can sense other people around you who are going through the same thing. So when I wrote to this day, it was really important for me to include other people that I knew in school who were getting it from a different angle. And it's at the time for me growing up in school, it was this very dangerous thing where you don't want to, you don't want to insert yourself and stand up for somebody else who's being bullied because you don't want their bully to then become your bully. You know what I mean? So it, it it's a very isolating experience. And so, and that leads to all kinds of all manner of problems um, mm -hmm. for people that are in school. And, to, to be surrounded in a sort of microcosm for society and then to be singled out and made alone through sort of social intimidation and stuff like that. It's why we see the rise in things like, you know, mental health problems and, and, and things of that nature. Right. The question becomes then, you know, I mean, it's certainly, you know, as it is with bigger issues, not an external thing that's going to change things. It has to be internal. It's something that has to be the driver there. Yeah. Um, I am, happen to be of the opinion that it is words. I think that it is through poetry, through music, through conversation, um, we're, we're, gonna, we're going to see some of that change. So I applaud you for your work and your efforts, um, certainly with this to this day, um, but just watching your whole TED talk too, prior to or you, you, know, you do the particular piece, um, it's just so inspiring. Um, do you find, in this case with this poem and in other poems as well, that poetry um, helps you work through things. Um, it's always been a sort of, you know, when I started writing, um, it was because I didn't have any friends. I didn't have anyone to talk to. And my grandmother one day just sort of put a notebook in front of me and said, you don't have anyone to talk to, you talk to this. And it's never going to judge you based on what kind of clothes you wear or who you are or who you like or your opinions or whatever. You can tell this anything and it's, it, it'll keep it for you, you know? And so that's really how I got started with, with writing. And it became such a, such a salve in a way to, you know, sort of heal up those wounds because I could, you know, just sort of crack open my book and if I was having a bad day and, and write a few things down. And it didn't start off as poetry, it was just sort of random thoughts on paper. Um, but uh, it also gave me a way to express myself. When I was going to school, and you, if you're constantly being told nothing you say has value or meaning, if you hear it over and over again, you start to believe it. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of, you know, it, it bottles you up in, in a certain way. 
And when that happens, that sort of pressure rises. This was a way to sort of like let off some of that steam as well. Not that other people were going to see it, but for myself, knowing that, you know, I could do that, it, it really gave me something to work with to help me through those tumultuous times. Well, and I imagine that outside of yourself then, um, when you shared this work with other people, um, you know, when they would read it or when they would watch it online or when you would present it before an audience, um, people's response to this, you know, that you are a poet, you're not a therapist, but I'm sure that I can only imagine how many people must have reached out to you, number one, to thank you for saying words that they wish they could have found for themselves to share, um, for being their voice, but also for, for advice. What has that been like for you, like this kind of response to a piece like this? It's, it's difficult, um, be it, precisely because of what you said. I'm not a therapist. I'm I'm just a poet. And sometimes you get letters online that are really um, affecting mm -hmm. um, in a way. And you do what you can. You know, you reach back with the numbers and the sort of information that you have on hand to sort of help them through. But it doesn't always feel like it's enough. And sometimes you... Sometimes you get letters from kids who are really on the edge of something and you reach back, but then you hear nothing back. And so it just kind of puts you in this um, weird space, uh, this sort of nebulous, vacuous space of not knowing what became of that person and what, how their journey ended or if they're keeping on going. And so it's hard. Um, I try to give, you know, the best advice I can, but I don't think there's one blanket answer for everything that every kid is going through. Um, so, you know, the advice I try to give most is, you know, find community through your interests. Um, because being bullied is, like I said, a very isolating, experienced um, for the people that are going through it and it leads to loneliness which then in turn fosters depression suicidal ideation um, things of those nature um, and having community can help mitigate some of uh, the mental and emotional pressure um, that come from bullying it's important to feel that you have support on some level, even if it's not direct support in dealing with a bully, mm -hmm. the kind of having an outlet or a platform where you can be yourself and be treated with respect for your views and your opinions, it's like, it's kind of like a poultice um, against the wound of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that bullying does is it demoralizes you. So it becomes really important to have something in your life that can balance that out and lift you up when you're feeling down because when you're bullied, you spend a lot of time feeling down. Mm -hmm. And so that's the advice I try to give people is find community and build community through your interests. And so that way it's, at least you're getting some positive flow into your life and not just feeding the negative beast. You know what I mean? Yeah. I go to something else, you know, it's, love and hate are beasts and the one that grows is the one you feed you know and so you you have to you have to feed that part of yourself not just take in the negative because all the negative is going to do is is poison you really you know right, right. well and i think um so spot on all of this um one thing that really um, hit home a moment ago is when you just said that find community, build community in your interests. Yeah. I think so many times people set out with the intention to, okay, so community, yes, but then they find the wrong community, the community they feel like they should be in. Right. But not necessarily the community that's for them. And that can sometimes lead to more of a detriment. So I think that second half of what you said is just as important as the first part of it. Yeah, I think it. Uh, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you growing up, you right off the bat, you're being inundated with questions like, what are you going to be? 
who are you going to be when you grow up? And that's, you know, that's a lot of stress for somebody to sort of think about. But it's like, if you reframe it in like, well, what are you interested in? You know, people tend to chase their interests more than they tend to chase, like, I mean, you know, I'm going to be a doctor because I should be a doctor. Okay, that's fine. But some rather than, it's easier to chase your passion than it is to chase something that you think is just, that's just the right move for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And so, yeah. and I think part of that, it, it leads to unhappiness. You find a lot of people who, who chase a profession rather than, you know, a profession that, you know, like, I mean, is certainly worthy and worthwhile, um, but also isn't something that gives them joy or satisfaction or, or any of those things we need to sort of maintain our mental health. Right, right, for sure. Um, yeah, no, uh, exactly. Um, so, you know, during COVID, um, we've all had to pivot. Um, so can you share like your personal experience with COVID and how you've, how you've poetically pivoted to stay connected with your audience, with your craft? Tell us what this has been for you. Um, everything came to a screeching halt, you know? Um, I was on the road one moment, you know, touring. This is how I support myself too. So I've made, you know, I've made a good life for myself, but to have it all of a sudden just sort of savagely curtailed was something I wasn't expecting. I don't think any of us were, obviously, because you saw a lot of people sort of flailing and wondering what to do. And for me, when it happened, the stage is something I use to deal or cope with some of the things that are going on in my life. It helps um, my mental health to be able to connect with others um, through that method. Um, and I'm passionate about it and I love it. I love doing it. But when it was taken away, I just kind of spiraled out into depression. The first wave hit me really, really hard. I think I spent 107 days alone, um, which was just the absolute wrongest thing I could have done. Wrongest thing I could have done. <laughs> um, um, it's the worst thing I could have done. Um, because like I said, you need community. But I just sort of cocooned inside of myself thinking I'll emerge and, and it just got harder and harder to break that, you know, that uh that shell i guess and as we head into the second wave i realized that i'm not able to employ the same strategy i did dealing with the first wave because it did not go well mm -hmm. um i've spent a lot of time in therapy dealing with this and trying to get back to normal i've got i guess what you could call juggernaut syndrome um which is when i'm going full force you can't stop me you know i'm but when I stop, it takes everything to put one leg in front of the other again and just to start mm -hmm. moving again. Um, and so it became really difficult. But what I decided to do to pivot, um, because I can't go out on the road and can't do live shows, is I decided to do a writing workshop. And I saw a lot of workshops online. Um, and, and they were all really good. But the thing that, I guess, bothered me about them were that, you know, you had 500 people crammed into one Zoom space and it was just, you know, the person talking for an hour and you didn't really get to engage on any level. Um, and, and to me, that w it felt like antithetical to community building. It was just, I was just going on. I might as well have been watching something on Netflix. Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, so I wanted to give people an experience that was more intimate. And so what I've done is created a series of workshops that, um, the class size is limited to 30 people so that we can have per personal interaction and discussion in class um, and things like that. And I wanted to do it over not just one one-off uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. When you sign up for the class, it's three weeks with one class a week and there's homework and there's, you know, and we come back and we have discussions. And to me, I guess the end goal or the hope with it is that through this process, one of the most valuable things I got out of the university experience was the round table experience. That helped me a lot with writing and editing and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I want to give that to other people so that by the end, when we reach the end of the workshop, it's not the end. Hopefully you fostered some community inside of the experience and are able to go off and continue your own writing group, continue the class. You don't need me there to do that, to, to you know, to critique one another's works or, or be helpful or mentor other people. And so there was another reason why I didn't want to put an age limit on it or a bracket around it, because I think there will be people with, you know, that have tons of writing experience and that wisdom and experience will be just as valuable to any new up and coming writer or, or youth that's coming into this as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, when I started off, I got involved in SLAM. Mm -hmm. And SLAM is interesting in that it's not a demographic that goes to SLAM, it's a psychographic, you know? So it, it, it's much more inclusive. And I want to bring that into what I'm offering to people. This is a really long answer. I'm so sorry. Oh, I love this long answer. Keep going. Uh, Don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but that is how I've chosen to pivot. But on the whole, I think that um, society or our communities in general are really suffering. And we're not really taking into account the dip that is going to follow uh, in our mental health with this. You have people that are missing weddings, they're having to postpone marriages. Um, the people, the graduating class of 2020, what a year. 2020, this is our grad year. They didn't get to go to prom. Right. They didn't, and it's like, I, I went to prom, my prom was horrible, but I still got to go, you know? It, and, it, and it is an experience, it's a valuable, you've reached the end of something, you've achieved something, where is that sort of sense of closure and celebration about it? Um, class of 2020 didn't get any of that. This month, Thanksgiving, spent it alone. My favorite time of year, Halloween. I don't know if there's gonna be trick-or-treaters out there on the street. Um, tonight, I would be going to see a Halloween kill, so I've been waiting a year to see this movie, and now I have to wait a whole other year. And people were like, oh, I just put it on pay-per-view. No. I want to go to a theater and sit next to screaming people and, you know, have that. I think in a larger sense, what we're really missing is each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we have screen fatigue. Yeah. We're, you know, it's, there's a lot of that stuff going on. And so I think it becomes really important. Like I keep saying community over and over again, but that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm passionate about right now. And that's what my pivot has been about. Um, to find that not just for myself, but for other people out there who are looking for it. Right. Well, we certainly value your voice and everything you shared for anyone this month, you know, again, um, bullying is something that happens every day, unfortunately. Yeah. In this one month, we really say stop, listen. And while with COVID, that bullying has shifted so now bullies don't have the opportunity to do it in person necessarily as much, but there is the online, the you know, cyber bullying, and that is just as um, hurtful and perhaps even more so because you were saying you, like you can't escape it. It doesn't have to start. You with can't escape it, and it and it comes from a place that is completely random. Do you know what I mean? You can be anybody online, you know. So in a lot of cases, you don't know, even know who's attacking you. Mm -hmm. It's just some random name on a screen. And people feel empowered to go out there and, you know, and say the things and do the things they, that they say and do because they have that anonymity behind them to sort of protect them. And uh, you, we're seeing it more, on, more and more online now where it's, I think it's really starting to affect our sense of empathy mm -hmm. um, toward each other because people aren't real anymore. They're just faces on a screen. And when we lose that, um, be prepared to lose so, so much more. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we see it in the streets now too. It's like a lot of the sort of political ire and outrage that is happening all around the world um, is just, it's a sign of that we're, we're struggling with our empathy. It's been cut off from us in a certain way. And as much as, you know, our devices we say connect us to one another, it's done a really good job of dividing us as well. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and you know, with this particular edition of the magazine that we're doing, you know, the stand up edition, so stand up for yourself, stand up for others, um, but to empower through empathy. Like, let's yeah. use that as a way to, um, to build each other up and to empower each other. Um, certainly empowering are your words and your sentiment that you shared here. Um, just can't thank you enough for this and taking this time. Thank you so um, much for the opportunity. You know, from um, one poet to another, I, I would like to say for all of those who um, want to be a poet someday, what advice you who is actually out there and doing it, because so many are like, how is this possible? Yeah. You can be a poet? What is, how do you do this? What advice would you have for that? Um, just don't stop yourself. Um, I think a lot of people get in their own way and they get in their own head about certain things. Um, one of the most beautiful things about writing and all art across the board is no one needs permission to be an artist. You know, you don't have to stand there and wait in line to, to, to I got my card, so now I'm a writer. It doesn't work that way. Um, a lot of jobs in the world, there's a clear path for it. It was one of the things I struggled with in school when, you know, like you, you told counselors what you want to be. Well, I want to be a writer. I want to be an artist. You know, they scratch their heads because they don't know how to tell you to be that thing or how you can become that thing. There isn't a clear path. You want to be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer. These are the classes you need. This is the school you want to go to. These are the grades you'll need to get. They've got that covered. If you want to be an artist, you really got to break out a machete and start, you know, cutting down some of your own path, you know, and making it for yourself. So I think, you know, just just don't fear it so much and 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 move toward it take another take another step toward it even if it's just a baby step and before you know it you you know you'll be walking and then you'll be jogging and then you'll be running hopefully you won't have juggernaut syndrome like i have and you'll just keep going <laughs> well it is excellent and amazing advice um thank you so much shane this has been just incredible and um just really appreciate you in your words and um and everything that you that you are and are doing so keep it up and keep inspiring and thank you so much for being a part of of this story you're so welcome thank you again have an enchanting weekend <laughs>